ambition in structural geology is to try and deduce the stress regime under which specific structures developed. The sorts of questions that we might want to ask are what conditions could faults slip under? Can we deduce the regional stress regime under which faults developed? And we can answer specific questions such as why are normal faults steep and thrust faults gently dipping? We can pose the problem, is normal faulting easier than thrusting? And are there particular ways in which the conditions in the earth might promote faulting? The tool we're going to use for this is something called the Mohr Circle. It's a graphical display developed by the German engineer Otto Mohr at the end of the 19th century. So let's think a little bit about stress in the earth. So let's imagine a column of rock and a cube of rock at the bottom of it. The stress is acting on this unit cube, primarily coming from the vertical load of rocks on top. And you might expect those rocks at the bottom to squeeze out sideways under that load. And indeed they would, except for the fact there are adjacent columns there doing the same thing to their cubes of rock at their bases. So that this particular cube in here is being compressed in all directions. We can describe the stress state in terms of three orthogonal axes and the rock is being loaded by entirely compressive stresses. The maximum compressive stress, we give the denotion sigma 1, the minimum compressive stress, sigma 3, and an intermediate stress axis to create our three-dimensional pattern, sigma 2. But let's keep this simple in a 2D world, and so we'll neglect sigma 2 for now and just consider the situation sigma 1, sigma 3. And in this particular situation, sigma 1, the maximum compressive stress is vertical, and it's trying to push the rocks out against sigma 3 in this direction here. So it's the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3 that will permit deformation. So one question we might want to ask is what, sort, what orientations of faults might develop under this loading condition. So let's think of this material as containing micro flaws. They might be micro fractures, grain boundaries and so forth, which are yet to slip but will become the seeds for faults. And we can think about this principal stress is acting on one of these surfaces. The principal stress is shown by the blue arrows will resolve onto that surface into two components. A normal stress acting perpendicular to the fault, or the potential fault, and a shear stress acting along it. So as we can see from the zoom in that what we've done is set up a vector triangle relating sigma 1 to the orientation of the normal stress, sigma n, and the shear stress on the potential fault, sigma s, through these equations here. So let's plot the relationship of sigma n, the normal stress, to the shear stress, sigma s. So here we have a graph which plots sigma s, the shear stress, against normal stress. And let's plot the situation when the principal stresses lie parallel to the normal stress. Sigma 1 is a higher value than sigma 3, so plots further along the normal stress axis. Halfway between sigma 3 and sigma 1 is the mean stress. So in this situation, we have the normal stress equal to sigma 3. There's no resolved shear stress in this orientation. Let's look at a new orientation of a fault slightly around here. So now there's an obliquity between the principal stress field and sigma n. We get a new relationship now and there's a shear stress exerted on the fault. Move a bit further around, the shear stress increases and increases some more as we change these angular relationships. As we get to this position here, the normal stress acting on our fault plane is halfway between sigma 1 and sigma 3. So it's the, equal to the value of the mean stress. So sigma n is equal to the mean stress. And we can read off what the shear stress would be in that orientation. Let's keep going around. Plot more orientations of the potential slip surfaces and the resolved shear stress and normal stress as we come down. Eventually to here, where the normal stress 
is parallel to sigma 1. So we plot the relationship between normal stress and shear stress for all the orientations of, of faults for a given pair of principal stress magnitudes, sigma 1 and sigma 3. These relationships plot as a circle. It's called the Moore circle after Otto Moore. Let's look at the angular relationships. And we can see that the relationship between sigma 1 and the normal stress is given with this angle theta plots as 2 theta on the Moore circle, which is an angle measured around from sigma 1 to the radius drawn from the mean stress out to our fault orientation at the edge. And from that, we can read off a shear stress and a normal stress from the graph. So that's the Moore circle, and it provides a relationship for a given sigma 1, sigma 3 pair for the relationships between shear stress and normal stress for a variety of fault orientations or potential fault orientations. But do they slip? In order to answer that, we need a failure criteria, a criteria which says under which faults will slip. What's plotted on the graph now is the so-called Coulomb failure criteria, which is, relates to frictional sliding on the fault surface. The orientations of fractures below that surface are stable, but beyond it are unstable, and they're critical for slipping if fault orientations lie on the failure line or failure criterion. So that's the point here on our particular Moore circle for the values of sigma 1 and sigma 3 we've used to construct it. We can read off the relationship between that point on the failure envelope and find off the orientation there as 2 theta. Look at its relationship to our block diagram on the side and you can see the relationship between sigma 1, sigma 3, the normal stress, and that fault is primed to move, it, it's, it's slipping. So what can we do with this information? Well, we can do it to establish which orientations of faults are likely to move given a particular stress regime. Let's look at this situation in here. We've got a fault, it will slip in that sense, so it is a normal fault. In order for the radius line from mean stress out to the margin of the circle to intersect the failure criterion, 2 theta there has to be greater than 90 degrees, it has to be an open angle to get us to that side of the graph. Therefore, the single angle between sigma 1 and sigma n, the normal stress, must be greater than 45 degrees. In turn, if we look at the vector triangle in here, the angle made therefore between sigma 1 and the fault surface must be less than 45 degrees to work that triangle through. So let's zoom that in to that situation. The angle between sigma 1 and the normal fault plane must be less than 45 degrees in order for that to slip. If we now put a conjugate fault in, so put the mirror image fault plane surface in here, we can see how this works. Sigma 1 must bisect the acute angle between the two fault surfaces. Sigma 3 bisects the open angle between these two conjugate fault planes. So here we have a set of faults seen in outcrop from New Zealand. We can draw in the faults, see the offsets, and we can therefore deduce the orientation of sigma 1 bisecting the acute angle between these conjugate faults. We can flip our diagram over. In this case, the bisector of the acute angle is horizontal. We're generating thrust faults in this situation. Let's look at an outcrop again from New Zealand. We can draw on the faults, show the offsets in there. The bisector of the acute angle, sigma 1, is horizontal. So horizontal sigma 1 is the stress state that characterizes thrust faulting. So let's step this into three dimensions. And this was worked out by Anderson in the early part of the 20th century, showing how Conjugate faults relate to the orientation in three dimensions to the three principal stresses, sigma 1 and sigma 3 we've looked at, and sigma 2, the intermediate stress axis, as we can see in this diagram. For normal faults, 
sigma 1 is vertical, sigma 3 is horizontal. And that situation flips for thrust faulting, so sigma 3 is vertical, sigma 1 is horizontal for thrusts. And for strike slip, both sigma 1 and sigma 3 are horizontal. Sigma 2 is vertical in this case. And an important rule is that sigma 2 runs parallel to the intersection between our two conjugate faults. This is Andersonian faulting. So let's look at this on a map from part of the Isle of Mull. A series of faults have been mapped out. Let's just pick them out in here. And they're making quasi-conjugate series in here. We can identify the bisector of the acute angle through there. That's sigma 1. The faults presumably are very steep. They're cutting from coast to coast across a hillside without changing trend very much. And the sigma 3 will be bisecting the open angle and sigma 2 will be vertical. So we can use the pattern of faults on the map to deduce the stress situation under which those faults formed. Anderson's theory applies to faults at initiation. So it's the important rule, sigma 1 bisects the acute angle. Normal faults must therefore dip at angles of greater than 45 degrees, commonly 60 or 70 degrees at initiation. Conversely, thrusts must dip at angles significantly less than 45 degrees in order for sigma 1 to bisect the acute angle. And in general, thrusts initiate at angles of 20 or 30 degrees or thereabouts. So let's go back to the Moore circle. Here we've got the situation that we developed earlier of sigma 1 vertical, sigma 3 horizontal, and the Moore circle just abutting the failure criterion. So normal faults are about to move. They're able to do so because the circle is large enough to intersect the failure envelope. So let's look at the situation now, where sigma 1 and sigma 3 are almost the same. In other words, the difference, the differential stress, is very small. You can see that we're a long way from the failure envelope, so the faults aren't going to be slipping here. Let's release sigma 3 a little. So sigma 3 is falling. The mean stress is reducing. But the circle is enlarging because the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3 is increasing until it intersects the failure criterion and a fault will slip. So the higher the differential stress, the greater the chance of fault slip. Reducing horizontal stress increases the propensity for normal faulting. Another way in which we can get our circle to intersect the failure envelope is simply to move it sideways. And that is the effect that fluid pressure has on faulting. It moves the whole Moore circle sideways, doesn't change the, act, the differential stress. So the circle remains the same diameter and then it abuts the failure criterion. So fluid pressure increases the probability of faulting. For normal faults, sigma 1 is vertical. The mass of rocks on top of the fault are controlling the value of the vertical load, sigma 1. But for thrust faulting, sigma 1 is horizontal. To understand this problem, we're going to have to change the scale a bit. We're going to have a constant depth, so sigma 1 is about to become sigma 3, and we're going to draw a circle out to the right, so that sigma 3 is where sigma 1 was for normal faulting, but sigma 1 for thrusting, showing the, the blue graph, has to be way out there on the right, so it has a higher value than sigma 3. We haven't hit the failure criterion. In order to do that, we have to push sigma 1 even further out. Notice that the mean stress for the thrust situation is significantly greater than it was for the normal fault, and so too, importantly, is the differential stress. The difference between the sigma 1 and sigma 3 is significantly higher for the thrust fault than it is for the normal fault situation. And that's because the more circle has to be that much larger, has a greater diameter, in order to intersect our failure criterion. But of course, for thrust faults, as with normal faults, fluid pressure will also have a role. So let's reduce the size of our Moore circle. 
Here we are. So we've got a situation here where the thrusting is not going to develop because the thrust circle doesn't intercept the failure criterion. But we can move it to the left by increasing the fluid pressure in the fault zones so that the fault can slip. We've not changed the diameter of the circle. So that's a brief introduction to the Moore circle. We've seen how we can use it to understand the relationship between faults and the stress fields within which they develop. We've used it to understand why the dips in normal faults and thrust faults can be different. We've seen briefly the role of fluid pressures in enhancing the probability of faulting.